Good morning. God in Malachi 1.11, speaking through the prophet, says this. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. At Corbin, we celebrate God's beauty as expressed through cultural diversity. In everything we do, locally and globally, we strive to meet each other with a humble disposition. And in everything we do, we hope to demonstrate love informed by the biblical mandate to love our neighbor as ourselves. Those last three statements come from Corbin's Theology of Multicultural Inclusion, a document that was developed a few years ago to help all of us in our community prepare for that great worship service depicted in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 and 10, where people from all nations, tongues, tribes gather at the throne of God to worship him and declare his great name. But how do we get there? How do we get to that point? How do we prepare for that experience? Well, that's what education is about, right? To be educated uh, about one another in a lot of ways, to prepare us for that great experience so that when we surround the throne with people from all tribes, tongues, and nations, 
We're not standing with strangers. We're standing with brothers and sisters. To reach that point, we have to know those people. We have to get to know them. And in order to get to know people, we have to understand each other's history, right? I think part of the problem we face today in our society, we face this summer, we face probably for our nation's history, is that we tend to not listen to each other. We listen to people, but they tend to be the people who are like us, right? Who look like us, talk like us, share a similar story to ours. But we don't spend the time listening to the stories of others to understand them. One of the first steps I think we need to do in order to develop a healthy relationship with people who are different from us is to first seek to understand. We need to engage, I heard this phrase yesterday, we need to engage with curiosity rather than contention. Boy, don't you see a lot of contention in our society today? People not listening, just contending for their ideas and their perspectives rather than seeking to understand. I had an experience like this uh, back when I was a resident director at another university. We lived in an apartment that had a, um, had a parking lot right next to my apartment. And my boys, my two little boys, their window was right next to that, that parking lot. It's about 1 a.m. on a college campus, and there's all kinds of noise going on out in that parking lot. And I was so mad in my spirit because they were going to wake my boys up. And they knew my kids lived there. So I was, uh, I was marching out there ready to just lay into those students, right? Thankfully, the Holy Spirit <laughs> got a hold of me and said, ask some questions before you attack them. So as I approached this group who were making all kinds of noise, I said, hey, what's, what's going on? What are you guys up to? It just so happens these weren't college students from our campus. They were people from the community who had no idea I had children right there. And so by asking questions and by seeking to understand what was going on, I diffused my own anger and was able to help bring some understanding to them as well. And they left in great spirits and were very kind about the situation. But I paused and I sought to understand. Today, we have an opportunity to practice some curiosity and gain some understanding. Most of us know a history of Oregon, but it's just a history. It's not a complete history, perhaps. The history you hear today may cause some conflict in your spirit. I would encourage you to sit with that, to afterward ask some questions for clarity and understanding. How many of you here have heard of the Oregon Trail? Raise your hand. I can't see you on live stream, but I assume many of you are probably raising your hand. I knew of the Oregon Trail back when I uh, grew up in eastern Montana. They even taught us about the Oregon Trail. How many of you here by a uh, raise of hands have heard of Oregon's Trail of Tears? Oh, good. A few of you. I had never heard of Oregon's Trail of Tears. The Oregon Trail is the history of white people coming from the Midwest over to Oregon. The other is a history of the native peoples of Oregon being displaced by the white people who had come. I didn't hear of that history until I was in my 40s. It had never been taught to me in school. When we only hear a version of history or a portion of history, we're limited in our understanding of all of God's people, right? Today we have the opportunity to learn not about our native brothers and sisters, but our African American family members. Oregon Black Pioneers is a statewide organization based here in Salem whose mission is to do historical research and honoring the lives of African Americans who have contributed to the historical development of Oregon. Now, I'm sure one question you're asking is, why are we getting a history lesson in chapel? Shouldn't we be hearing this in Scott Bruce's class or John Scott's class? I get those guys, but they're both history professors. So shouldn't this be something we do in, in a history class, right? Well, that's the wonder of Corbin, is that we integrate our faith into all the things that we learn. You know, just yesterday I was walking with Will Richmond, and he was on his longboard, and we were walking to a class, and he was talking about gravity and how it pulls his longboard, and then he got off on, I think it was nuclear forces or something. It went way over my head pretty quickly. But what impressed me wasn't so much that, but how seamlessly he then started talking about the power of Christ to hold all things together in his hand. And I was so impressed 
at Will's Corbin education that brought this beauty of science together with his faith in Christ. That's an awesome experience. And it's one that I hope you're gaining as you're here at this, at this institution. Part of our spiritual formation, I think, is then to hear issues and perspectives of our day and from our society that then help inform our faith. And that's what we're hoping to give you today. So my prayer as you listen today is that your faith will be stirred by the history that you learn. Our speaker today is Gwen Carr. She's currently on the board of Oregon Black Pioneers and serves on the program committee. In her role, she develops exhibits, displays, and does presentations for schools, uh, colleges, historical societies, and civic organizations. She has curated three exhibits in Oregon's, on Oregon's black history at the Oregon Historical Society Museum in Portland and was co-leader of the 2018 exhibit entitled Racing to Change, Oregon's Civil Rights Years. I feel like I've seen that somewhere. Oh yeah, it's right here in our mezzanine. So after chapel or later today, it's gonna be leaving about four o'clock. Take a chance uh, and head up there and take a look at that and learn a little bit more about Oregon's civil rights years. But for now, would you please w welcome me in joining our speaker, Gwen Carr. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Corbin University for inviting me here to talk about Oregon's black history. I'm hopeful that my talk will help form a foundation for further steps to understand racism in our community and in our institutions. An issue that will continue to haunt this country until we have addressed and rooted out racism in all its forms. It's often called America's original sin. I'll let you sit with that for a little bit. Organizations all over the state and all over the country are doing the same thing. They're exploring the current state of race in their environment by looking back at the historical foundations for it and the current realities in which it's being manifest. So we're talking about business organizations, civic clubs, nonprofits, uh, schools, and even churches. My faith story actually begins uh, quite young. I was baptized, fully immersed as a Baptist when I was uh, in third grade. This was uh, in Los Angeles. I later became a, a Lutheran and I now attend uh, Christ the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church right down on State Street. My role models in my faith have been very uh, impactful women in my life. My grandmother, my mother, my aunts, and women of the church who taught by their actions what a woman of God was like. One dedicated to worship and reverence, to prayer, to service, and commitment to acting out in our lives the values that Jesus taught. A little bit about my personal story. I'm 72 years old, I'm mother of one, who happens to be a Clackamas County Deputy Sheriff. You can imagine what some of our conversations are like these days, very interesting. And he's the father of four children, one who's studying for a master's in art history in Portland, another who is in her second year at Chemeketa and plans to become a veterinarian one day, one as a senior at McKay High School, again, not too far from here, and wants to be a screenwriter and the, the last one, a junior at McKay, who one day wants to be a lawyer and the other day wants to be a doctor. So I'm not sure which way we're going with this. I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents had come there after World War II. They married, uh, my father went to school on the GI Bill and they bought a home. I went to a segregated school in first grade. I lived in Texas just prior to coming to Los Angeles. And so I'm one of the last people that actually went to a segregated school. That's an all black school. Uh, we were not allowed to eat in certain restaurants or go to uh, movie theaters. We had to sit in the balcony. My grandparents were sharecroppers. And so I came to understand that life right after uh, slavery. When I did come to California, uh, although the school was not segregated, we lived in East Los Angeles, 
where the majority of people who lived there were either Hispanic, African American, or Japanese. All of us limited in one way or another by where we were able to buy homes, to work, to become educated, and to play. Although I didn't understand it at the time, where we lived, where we worked, and where we played was determined by race. At that same time, when I was coming up, there were still lynchings going on in the South. Sit-ins, protests, freedom riders, churches and homes were being bombed. People's lives were at stake. The only time, though, in my neighborhood, which was uh, about a 99% black neighborhood, the only time we saw white people, for the most part, was the police or the insurance guy coming to try to make some money off of us. So 50 years ago, when I was a young college student like yourselves, we thought we had racism on the run. We marched, we protested, we boycotted, we spoke out, and we were called domestic terrorists. We formed organizations like the Black Student Union to advocate for the teaching of African and African American history, the hiring of black teachers. And particularly, we were, prou we were proudly call, we proudly call for black power. Sound familiar? Some of those same images are shown on our kiosk that he just referred to on Racing to Change. At that time, we thought that once the old segregationists and white supremacists and racists di uh, died out, we would have equality. However, we've come to recognize that racist attitudes are embedded in every aspect of our lives and culture, and we can no longer say we live in a post-racial society. The civil rights laws that were enacted in the 1950s and 60s aimed at legal discrimination in the workplace, in housing, in public accommodations. But now we know that was just the tip of the iceberg. And we now need to continue to root out racism beyond diversity, beyond inclusivity statements. And so today I am going to help us to understand how we got here. First of all, most of you know there's a very small population of blacks in the state of Oregon, now just reaching about 2%. And I always think that's so small, and yet when you look at the states around us, it's not that different. Washington, the percentage is about 4%, and even California, the percentage is 6.5%. The overall black population across the United States is only about 13%. So I think that's kind of an interesting fact to keep in the back of your mind as we're talking about some of these things. Oregon, however, is simply one of the whitest states in the U.S. of A. So let's take a look at some of that history. First of all, the, uh, we're able to document that the earliest incident of a person of African descent in Oregon territory, it was a territory then, was in 1788. And he was a sailor on board a, a ship that was doing exploration. Now, a lot of academics will tell you that there were likely Africans on board earlier excursions, because you might remember in the 1500s, there was a lot of exploration happening up the Pacific coast, California, Washington, uh, Canada. But we know this for sure because this, in this situation, this was fully documented. They put in at uh, Tillamook, you know where Tillamook is, over on the coast. And unfortunately, the same day that they put in there, he was involved in an altercation with the natives that were there, and he was killed. So he literally arrived and died in Oregon on the same day, 1788. Most people will say that they know about York. Do you know about York, who was with the Lewis and Clark expedition? That was in the early 1700s. And during that same time, though, and shortly thereafter, there were also black explorers all over what is now called Oregon Territory. In fact, one of them was a part of the explorers who uh, was able to do the trailblazing for what's called the Applegate Trail. Now, a lot of people will know about the Oregon Trail, and that's shown in red in the visual. But the Applegate Trail is shown in blue, and it literally follows kind of the same path as I-5, 
if you're going like, uh, particularly if you get down around Roseburg, you'll see signs that say Applegate Trail. Well, know that one of the men that blazed that trail was a man named Moses Harris, a black man. And that information is told, by the way, over at the Polk County Museum right in uh, Rickrail, which is where that trail actually began. So we know that he was at least one of those men that we can identify for sure that was a part of that early exploration in Oregon. Now, uh, during the time that Oregon is developing as first a, a territory, uh, a provisional government, a territory, and then a state, Oregon, like other states, had to grapple with the issue with what are we gonna do with all these slaves? What if they come out here? What if they're here now? How do we feel about this? And so from Oregon's very beginnings back in uh, 1844, as it was constructing itself as a provisional government, it decides to declare slavery illegal, which sounds pretty good to me, but on the other hand, it also proclaimed itself as not being a place that they wanted to invite blacks to come, or if they were already here, wanted them to leave as quickly as possible. So they began enacting a series of laws called the Black Exclusion Laws. And we read about some of those, the Lash Law, where if you were in the territory over a number of days, you could receive so many, uh, so many lashes and be expelled from the territory. So Oregon from the beginning has had this thing going of being a free state and yet very unwelcoming, which is putting it lightly, to, uh, for blacks to, to come here. And so when you start answering the questions, why aren't there more blacks in Oregon, you can kind of look back and see this is kind of the beginning of that. The foundation was being laid for that even in Oregon's earliest days. So by uh, 1859, when Oregon becomes a state, it comes into the union as a free state, but also in its constitution are black exclusion laws. And by the way, that constitution is available for you to actually take a look and look at those laws. It's down in uh, archives in uh, downtown Salem. We have utilized that in several of our exhibits so you can actually see the wording. We have the, the uh, copies of the votes that were taken when Oregon was deciding were we gonna be a free state? Were blacks going to be welcome here or not? It's a very interesting thing to take a look at. Now, in spite of these laws that came on and off the books from the beginning, there was really only one instance that we can document where a black man was legally expelled from Oregon. I mean, in a court case. He was a, uh, a man named Jacob Vanderpool who lived in Oregon City. He ran a boarding house there, and this is a, uh, a copy of an advertisement about that boarding house. Apparently he was, he was doing well, so well in fact that uh, one of his competitors down the street suddenly realizes, wait a minute, this guy's not even supposed to be here. So he brings up charges against this guy, and within days, Jacob Vanderpool is expelled from the state of Oregon. Uh, it's one of those situations kind of expelled for being black, if you will. There are at least two other situations, uh, legal cases, where uh, blacks, there were attempts made to expel blacks from Oregon, but luckily, at least in one case, some of their white neighbors came to their rescue and signed a petition to have them uh, be able to stay as an exception to this law. Now, in spite of all of these laws, again, that came on and off, we know that there were black people living all over the state of Oregon. In this visual, it's meant to show you the variety of places in which blacks have lived uh, in the early 1800s and on up into the 1900s. So if you look at that, you can see literally in all corners of the state. Now, again, not very many, but one or two here, one or two there. And I'm gonna talk about some of those because they're good illustrations of what was going on um, in Oregon at the time. Uh, the issue of slavery. As I mentioned, that's been a, um, an issue with Oregon from the very beginning. One book that I can really recommend that really dives deep into that subject is this book. It's called Breaking Chains, and it's by a man named Greg Noakes. Uh, Greg did a lot of research 
uh, really stimulated by his own history. He was doing some of his own genealogical work and found that he was related, he was a descendant of one of the men who was a key figure in one of Oregon's famous slavery cases. And it's called the Holmes case. And so his book is really, it has a beginning in the Holmes case in his relation to that. Now slavery, when we say slavery in Oregon, we're not talking about the same kind of slavery in Oregon as you commonly think that happened in the South. For example, you know, normally when you think slavery, uh, you picture the big plantations like in Mississippi or Alabama, places like that, you know, big white columned houses, big hoop skirts, thousands of slaves at a time. Uh, most of the whites that came here that had slaves, they only had one or two, and they were poor farmers. And so they didn't have that luxury of being the big landowner, but they had slaves nevertheless. Some of those slaves were promised that if they came with them to Oregon, then they would be freed, because after all, Oregon was a free state, right? Or they were told that if they did not come with them to Oregon, then they would be sold. And so that would, that would mean kind of uh, going along with something that you knew about, at least you knew this slave owner, as opposed to being out there and you don't know where you're gonna end up. And so you have a variation of stories about how slaves came to Oregon. I wanna tell you about some of those because they really illustrate the wide spectrum of slavery in Oregon. Now this is a picture of a, uh, a woman named Mary Jane Holmes Shipley Drake. Her connection with this whole story is that she was one of the children of a man and his wife that were brought here by slave owners and they were told that they would be freed when they reached Oregon. Well, that wasn't exactly correct. The slave owner actually freed some of them but also kept some of the children. She was one of the children that was kept. And in the end, their parents had to sue uh, to get their children back. It's a long story. It's a very interesting story there. And we've got all the court records and what have you. It's a very interesting read. Some of that is contained in Greg's book about slavery. And so they sue, which again, would have been very unusual because here you have people that aren't even supposed to be here legally, and they find enough um, uh, people who are willing to support them, a lawyer, a judge, several other people who came to their rescue to help them pull off this very important legal case. And so in the end, they did get their children back. Another interesting part, uh, particularly about Mary Jane, she was one of the younger children that was free. In the end, she marries a man named Reuben Shipley, a black man, who had settled down near um, Corvallis in a town right out, uh, which is now Philomath. Some of you may know where Philomath is. And he, uh, he's a farmer there, but he also starts buying property. And at one point, he's able to buy 60 acres of land. Now again, remember, in spite of these laws coming on and off the books. Uh, the interesting thing about him is that he donated two acres of that land to be used as a cemetery. That cemetery is still there, by the way. It's called the Mount Union Cemetery. Um, and it was under the provision that blacks could be buried there. And again, that, uh, that uh, cemetery still exists. But that was one of Oregon's famous cases around slavery. Another case that we refer to a lot that has to do with slavery is uh, the Letitia Carson case. Letitia Carson was a black woman who had a common law husband uh, who was from Ireland named David Carson. They came over the Oregon Trail together. And as a matter of fact, she had a baby, uh, Martha, who is pictured, the woman pictured in the, uh, in the upper left-hand corner there. They have one child, Martha, along the trail, and then they end up down in Douglas County and they have another child, a son named Adam. Well, what do you know? They're there, they're farming, doing well, and David Carson suddenly dies. Uh, again, one of the neighbors, instead of coming to her rescue and being a good neighbor, decides, well, wait a minute now. 
you know, I'm going to be the executor of his estate. She doesn't even uh, deserve to be here. She's a slave. She likely was not, oh, let me turn this back a second. She was likely not his real wife anyway. Uh, and so they basically took her property, her land and all the possessions that they have. Again, Letitia Carson is able to find some support through the courts. She sues not once but twice and eventually gets her property back and her uh, possessions back. So it's a very, again, a very interesting case uh, connected with the whole issue of slavery. By the way, that uh, picture on the right is, uh, of course, that's me on the left, and on the right of me is a woman named Jane Kirkpatrick, one of uh, uh, Oregon's famous and fabulous uh, women writers. She usually writes about women's stories, and the story that she uh, has written about the Letitia Carson case is contained in a book that she wrote not too long ago called A Light in the Wilderness. So if you're looking for some historical novel, kind of light reading based on historical fact, uh, that's a good one. Now, this is a story uh, about a woman named Amanda Gardner Johnson. Amanda was a, a young girl who had been given as a wedding gift to a family that was coming to Oregon. Now, normally when I tell that story, uh, particularly with uh, teenagers or younger children, they say, oh no, that, that can't happen. You can't give a person as a gift. But you might remember that back in those days, uh, slaves were not considered uh, humans. They were considered property. So just like you might have so many horses, so many cows, so many goats, so many slaves. And you look back in some of those old um, property uh, records, and that's exactly what you find. Most of the time, you don't find their name at all. You find so many men, so many women. Uh, so she was one of those kids, if you will, that was given as a wedding gift for this couple coming to Oregon. So she ends up on the Oregon Trail as well. And ultimately down in Albany, not too far from here, uh, she marries uh, another ex-slave, Ben Johnson. He's a blacksmith. And they end up living the rest of their lives down in Albany. She's freed. He has, he has been freed. But again, think about the backdrop of these laws that they have to li uh, live in spite of these things. Oops. I'm going too fast here. This is another kind of spin on the slavery story. This man is John Livingston, and he was brought to Oregon and told initially that he would be free. And in this case, he was. Not only was he free, but he was given property up in the Oregon City area, which he kind of flipped, if you will, and turned into a business for himself. So he ends up being one of these men who would, uh, uh, he had log a logging concern there just above Oregon City at a time when they were building those sidewalks, the first sidewalks in Oregon City. So some of you that have been up 99, and you kind of come around that curve there uh, near the bluffs, and you enter old Oregon City, that's about where uh, he stayed, just above those bluffs there. And every time I come around there, I can't help but think about him. So not only did he turn it into a business, but when you read his obituary, you see that he also ultimately owned property in Salem and also in Central Oregon. So here's a situation where a man comes here as a slave, he's free, he's given property, and he turns it into a business, a prosperous business. This is a picture of a man named Louis Southworth. Uh, Louis came here as a slave and he was enabled to buy his freedom uh, his freedom cost him $1,000, by the way. He was allowed to go and work, and if you look closely at the picture, you'll see that there is a fiddle sitting on top of that clock there. That fiddle uh, demonstrates the kind of stuff that he was known for doing. He played music. He was a musician. So he would go to churches. He would go to dance halls, anywhere that they would uh, hire him. And that's how he was able to earn his... Uh, Freedom, $1,000. Uh, 
Now, kind of like John Livingston, he parlayed that into future businesses down on the Alsea River. Some of you may know where that is. It's heading out uh, to the coast. He and another man, a white friend of him, actually founded a school down there. And he had, you know, he, he was one of these people that sort of went from place to place. So we know about him being in Benton County, in Lynn County, uh, even in Marion County. So he has a long history, again, a very interesting history of survival in Oregon. Now, a couple of women whose cases are interesting to me, too. Uh, the house on the left is currently on the National Registry of Historic Places, and it once belonged to a woman and her daughter, Hannah and Eliza Gorman, who had come to Oregon as slaves in 1844. Uh, they originally settled in Polk County, which is just across the river, but by the, the 1850s, they were in Benton County. Hannah was a laundress and Eliza an accomplished seamstress. So what do you know, as part of this national registry work, we have both University of Oregon and Oregon State involved in restoring this house, but also doing archeological digs around the house. And what do you think they found? Thimbles. They found buttons, all sorts of things that this laundress and the seamstress would have used. So it makes a very interesting story. That house, by the way, if you're interested, is in Corvallis and it's on 4th Street. So if you have any interest in going down there and taking a look at it, it's a very interesting place. Uh, their brother, Hiram, for example, has Salem connections. At one point, he worked for the Statesman Journal in the olden days before they had the electric printing presses. He was the guy that stood there and literally used his own weight and energy to run those presses. Um, so he's a, a, a Salem person, if you will. He's buried, by the way, in the Pioneer Cemetery out on Commercial. Here's another kind of interesting thing. That Pioneer Cemetery on Commercial contains uh, grave sites of over 40 black pioneers that lived in the mid Willamette Valley. We were shocked to hear that, frankly, because we're doing almost one by one research on some of these people. And we happened to run into some of the people there who have been keeping uh, the research alive on everyone who's buried there. And so if you go onto their website, Friends of the Pioneer Cemetery, you can click on ethnicity and it will do a drop down list. For example, if you're looking for African Americans, it'll do a drop down list by name. You click on that name and it will tell you everything that they know and have learned about these black people who are buried there. So again, a very interesting piece. Um, another kind of piece that was going on at the time was the introduction of segregated schools. Now, you'll notice that there were two uh, that were put together in the 1860s, one here in Salem. So if you know where Macy's is, used to be uh, Myron Frank, on the northern corner was the original location of that Salem's Colored School. They call it Little Central because Salem's original school was called Salem Central, so this was Little Central. Uh, and it was a place where black children could go to school. They weren't allowed to go to public school. Uh, in spite of the fact, by the way, that they had to pay taxes, school taxes. Uh, and so a bunch of black people that were here and some of their white supporters were able to uh, get enough money together so that they were able to have a school. And that school lasted five or six years, as I recall. Um, there was also one very similar situation in Portland one in Vernonia, and one in Maxville. Those are the three that, that we know of for sure. We know about black people in some of the early days in Oregon also from newspaper articles. I think this one is interesting because it talks about uh, a colored woman who donated $250 uh, from her salary or her wages as a scrub woman toward the renovation of Salem Hospital. Now, we all know where Salem Hospital is. That's what it looked like in 1920. And so kind of like they do now, you have all these um, fundraisers 
uh, and campaigns to try to uh, get money to do renovations and that kind of thing. The interesting thing to me, though, is that nowhere in this article is she named. She's called the colored woman in the headline, and even down in the text, she's again referred to as that colored woman. The, probably the earliest large influx of blacks into Oregon was as a result of the Transcontinental Railroad. And so you start to see blacks that are working at Union Station or that are working uh, on the trains that came in and out of Union Station. Blacks were literally recruited from the South to come uh, to Portland to be a part of that. And if you think about where history was at that point, these are people who are maybe 40 years out of slavery. And now they have an opportunity not just to be uh, sharecroppers like my grandparents were, which was sort of a, a legalized um, option after slavery, uh, but they had opportunity to earn some real money, to travel, to build homes, to, uh, and a whole community grew up around Union Station uh, in Portland. This is kind of your typical um, visual, I guess, of how most white people saw black people that worked at Union Station. They were porters, they were waiters, they were red caps. Um, the place was just alive with black workers, and that was why they were recruited there specifically for that. Now, uh, around that same time, or a little later, the 1920s, uh, the Klan began to infiltrate Oregon and Oregon politics. Um, and they were everywhere. There were Klan chapters in Portland and Salem and Eugene and Medford and Dallas. Wherever I go all over the state, uh, for some reason people think that wherever they are is where the headquarters of the Klan was. But in truth, there were claverins all over. In fact, uh, and this is a, a picture really of Skinner's Butte. Some of you from Eugene may know where that is. Um, and if you, I don't think you can see it very clearly, but that round circle uh, is meant to circle a cross that was up there. And that was the place where the Klan would go and burn their cross. And there's also the letters KKK across there. There's been a lot of controversy about that butte and how that was used and even usage of the cross. Uh, I think there is still a cross there, but not used in the way it was in the 20s. Uh, there's also, you can see, uh, you know, they weren't ashamed at all of being white supremacists. Here's a flyer saying, oh, we're having this big parade. Come out and see us. We've even seen flyers about big gatherings that were going to happen at the fairground in Lane County. Some of you may know where that is. This is a, um, a picture taken from the Oregonian back in the 20s, too. And it says, uh, chief Kluxers tell law enforcement officers just what Mystic Organization proposes to do in the city of Portland. So here you have the Klan literally shaking hands with and infiltrating the police, politics. Uh, it went all the way to the governor's mansion. So uh, be sure to take a look at that too because we have a long history of Klan activity in, in Oregon. Uh, at one point during that time, Oregon was said to have the largest clavern west of the Mississippi. And when you think about that, you know, that is really something to be said. So that shows you how many uh, Klan people were actually here in Oregon. Uh, one of the results of having the Klan in Oregon, by the way, I should say that the Klan in Oregon uh, was not just attempting to intimidate uh, black people, but it also focused on Catholics, on Jews, on other non-whites or people whose religion they didn't agree with. So that was just a part of what the Klan was doing here in Oregon. But in this case, this was a young woman who graduated from Salem High School. It's now uh, North Salem, it would be that same building. And uh, she attempts to go to Oregon State. She's accepted into Oregon State. But when she gets there, there's no housing for her because blacks were not allowed to uh, 
uh, lived in the same residence halls as white. And this was not just Oregon State. The same was true at University of Oregon and probably most uh, colleges in Oregon and across the country. She eventually um, graduates in 1926. Now, the Klan connection here is that her family was still in Salem, but they were being intimidated by the Klan. There were flyers being left on their doorstep telling them that they needed to get out of town or else. That or else might meant uh, that your house would be burned down or that you could be lynched or that you could be hurt in some way. And so the family leaves Salem and moves on to Portland. So by the time she graduates in 1926, she does not come back to Salem. She goes to Portland because that's where her family had moved to. By the way, that picture there of that residence hall uh, is now named for her. And so I think it's kind of ironic that she couldn't live in a residence hall when she was a college student like you, but years later, her, um, you know, some of the work that she did while she was there, both on campus and later as an educator, is honored with a residence hall named in her honor at Oregon State. By the way, my grandson, the one who's working on his master's now, actually was in that dorm for a while. You know, they have co-ed dorms now. When I was, do you have co-ed dorms here? Oh, I see, no, no. <laughs> well, when I was in college, we didn't have co-ed co dorms. I went to Cal Lutheran down in Thousand Oaks. There was a boys dorm, girls dorm. Anyway, long story. Uh, but anyway, that dorm is named for her. In uh, the 1940s, Portland becomes a real shipping center, shipbuilding center. And so once again, blacks are recruited out of the South primarily to Portland. And yet there was a lot of uh, not only Klan activity, but also just racist activity going on. And as shown here, uh, we have a person saying they were surprised that all along Union Avenue, there were signs that said white trade only. This is an example of one, which meant there were some places that you could not, um, you know, there were restaurants you couldn't go in. There were places where you couldn't have homes, that kind of thing. Now, we're sort of getting to current day, and in my time left, I just want to say just a couple of things about this. Restrictive covenants, redlining, sundown laws, those are all uh, results of racism in Portland, some in Salem, in Eugene, we actually see copies of restrictive covenant documents that say you cannot rent or you cannot uh, uh, sell to uh, a black person. Today we're talking about systemic and institutional racism and things like microaggressions. So I would encourage you to take an interest in what these things mean, because depending on who's doing the talking, you get a lot of variation of what that means for them. But there's plenty to take a look at online and I would just encourage you to ask questions and, and talk about it. There's evidence that racism, although gone in many forms, is still alive and you see it in some of these things. Oops. You also see it exhibited here. I just Googled racial incidents in Oregon and I pulled out the ones that were central to Salem or nearby communities. And here we see graffiti, we see racial incidents, slurs and all sorts of things. So it's embedded, it, it is still here. Okay, so now we're in the time where we're talking about anti-racism, which is kind of the proactive uh, way of looking at racism. So now we're questioning uh, policies, policies and practices in our police, in our schools, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. And you know, let me say this, as a Christian and as a follower of Christ, I see racism as evil. I see it as a sin. I see it as an affront to the gospel of Jesus and to God who created all of us in his image. So do black lives matter? Well, I can tell you it matters to me, not just because I'm black either, but because history confirms that for too long, they have not mattered. We have not mattered. I have not mattered. In the beginning, a slave 
you know, when we were slaves, we were considered non-humans. We were considered property. Under Jim Crow and segregations, we were less than the, the three-fifths rule. Uh, with legal discrimination, we were devalued. And today, we're undervalued. So, you know, it's very personal with me. And I'm hopeful as uh, young people, as Christians, as our future, that it will become personal with you too. Um, you know, I don't want to have to have the talk with my grandchildren anymore. I don't want them to live in fear of being able to walk out the door or doubts about whether they'll be able to find a good job or live where they want to live. My hope and prayer is that 50 years from now, they won't have to stand like I'm standing in front of you talking about the history of black people in Oregon or where we are now with the whole issue of racism. So again, I want to thank you for having me here. And I just need to say two names because I can't leave here without seeing them. One, I have to say the name of Breonna Taylor. Although I didn't talk about you know, the whole police brutality thing, I could for hours, but this is not about that. This is about the history, but I have to say her name once again. The other name, though, that I want to say is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, an activist, a leader, um, a woman whose name needs to be mentioned along with other activists who put their lives on the line, uh, either with various systems that they were working in or on the streets, like a, a John Lewis, for example. So again, thank you for having me here. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Gwen's going to be with us for lunch, so if you have heard something that sparked an interest or curiosity, come ask some questions uh, and engage her over lunch in the dining hall, if you're able to. Those on live stream aren't able to. Will you pray with me as we close? Father, our ears have heard another history. Names, stories of your children. Uh, they've been treated how they have persevered. And Lord, now the work is ours to sit with that, to engage that learning, and to ask you for guidance on how we then should live now that we have heard and learned some new information. Guide each of us to an action that brings honor and glory to your name so that you might be known among the nations. To your glory and honor, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming and participating today. Got that.